as far back as I can remember, just wanted to to play, and, and I I was so sort of uh, so convinced that this is what I would be doing. I kind of ignored everything else. My schoolwork was just appalling, you know. That how does the school sort of put up with me and and my first my parents got me my first drum kit when I was nine years old um, because I I made the effort to I, I sort of left school one day you know like you do at sort of four o'clock or whatever time it was and I'd heard that there was a drum kit for sale um, Graham Eldridge who was had this drum kit for sale and he lived in a house with a thruppenny bit window in St John's Road in Newport and I just sort of, instead of going home after school, I wandered and walked all the way to Newport, which was a bit of a schlep, you know, about sort of six or seven miles huh? and um, I found the, found the house and knocked on the door uh, and said, oh, you know, I think you, got, you have a drum kit for sale? I said, yeah, and it took me in and sort of showed me this old, it was almost like a vaudeville kit, there was like brass symbol and one sort of hanging tom, an odd side drum, and the, the, the hi-hats. It, anyway, it, it didn't matter, because I just thought it was the most amazing thing. And then I walked all the way home. And when I got in, my parents were furious. They were going, where have you been? You know, well, we've been worried sick. Yeah, and, and, so, and, and I said, you know, I said to my dad, well, I, there's, I heard there's this drum kit for sale in Newport, and I walked there, and I had a look. And my dad said, well, show me. You, you show me where you went, you know? And we jumped in the car and we drove all the way back. And Dad, you know, bing bong. Uh, he said, Did it? my son came and look at a drum kit earlier on. And the woman said, oh yes, would you like to come in and have a look? You know, sort of wiping her hands with the tea towel. It was all very mumsy. And my dad was, was so impressed that I'd sort of had the oomph to go and do that, that he said, you know, how much do you offer it? It was 10 quid. Which doesn't sound a lot now, but I think my, mom, oh, yeah. my dad then was earning about 17, uh, you know, 17 quid a week or something in the prison service. And he bought the drum kit. And then I, I sort of, I got to the school the next day and I told the music teacher about this drum kit. So she said, right, bring it into assembly. And, I, you know, this is the first kit I've ever had. And I just sort of took to it. It, I, it had no sort of mystery at all it was sort of what it was meant to be and my dad was really excited because he kept saying oh i used to play drums when i was in it i used to play in the, uh -huh. the women's institute hall and stuff and i'm not sure that he ever did actually because i'd say well show me and he'd go no oh, yeah, come on this is for you to do so i never ever heard him play the drums you know in, in all my life <laughs> but uh, that was it and that was the first time i felt i just felt really famous, I suppose, because the music teacher was really impressed and she said, oh, we've got to feature this in the choir thing, and then we went off and did a gig at Carisbrook, um Secondary Modern, as it was then, and the parents all, wow, this is just great, you know, and then in the car on the way back home, my dad was saying to my mum, Bridget, did you, did you see that, did you hear that, you know, and then, and that was it, it was kind of like the touch paper had been lit, and, um, it also coincided with hearing Cream and uh, seeing Ginger Baker on top of the Pops playing I Feel Free or, uh, you know, one of the great Cream songs and Eric Clapton stood there and Jack Bruce giving it all of this great voice and amazing bass playing. Uh, and I was sort of absolutely besotted with seeing this band. Um, that I, I'd got a Cornflex box and I cut the front out and made three figurines that I was sort of dance around and put the put the album on, which my granny bought me for my birthday, and was just sort of seeing them play. The thing is, is that the drums are pretty noisy, as you know, and my mum yeah. was really worried about neighbours because we just lived in, ter uh, you know, terraced houses. And uh, so, and it was the drums were set up in the landing, you know, upstairs. And, and because it was in the landing, it was even more resonant. So uh, she wouldn't let me in. I was forbidden to play the drums because it would annoy the neighbours. So sort of Thursday, every Thursday afternoon, she'd go to the supermarket to get shopping. And I used to go like hell uh, <laughs> on the drums. You know, I had like, this sort of this 
No, was that only a short window? Oh, yeah, yeah, 90, yeah minutes. 90 minutes. Was that it? A week? So you could practice. Yeah, but you instead of it's a femoral, you know, that if you if you get it, you can do uh, you just do so much of it in your head, you know. It's like constantly lying. Any any young drummer will tell you that. You know the the great sound you get from your chest when you all that sort of good. And I'd just be fiddling around. My granny and granddad but we'd sort of go out in their Austin 1100 for an ice cream on Cow Seafront. And I was just sort of thinking about rooms. Yeah. And my granddad would go, shut up, would you? <laughs> but that was just it. I, you know, in a way, I suppose you, you could say that I, I probably had a bit of a condition. If I look back on it now, you know, that I was always, you know, hands flying about and stuff and... Anyway, you can do a lot of this stuff in your head. It's funny because if you leap forward to now, well, actually, leap forward to 1990, um, we played a gig. We were on to, we had Gary Husband uh, in the band on drums, and we had the, the late great Alan Holdsworth on guitar. And Alan, Alan is a truly great musician of all time, you know, just a phenomenal virtuoso, as is Gary. But, um, Anyway, we were touring and we played Leeds University or something like that. And uh, we sort of just getting off the tour bus. And there was this kid, this uh, 11 year old kid, who stood there with an armful of albums. And he said, uh, You know, could you sign this? Yeah. And then he said, Can I come in and uh, watch the sound check? He said, I, go, I love, love the band. Yeah. He said, Yeah, sure, come on in and watch it. And then he said, Can I have a go on Gary's drums? <laughs> yeah, and Gary was real sweet at heart, you know, and and, uh, and he had the photographs to show us, and uh, and he got on, and, and I said, you know, what songs do you want to play, you know, what songs do you know, and he said, oh, I know all of them, and uh, <laughs> anyway, off he went, and it, that's that was Pete Ray Biggin, who's drummer in the band now, so at, at eleven years of age, that's an amazing that sort story. of that precocious talent, um, you know, and and Pete. You know, Pete's sort of on the spectrum as well. So he's, uh, you know, he, he's really quick. You want to see him in a go kart? It's just incredible. We always go karting on days off when we're out on tour. It seems to, it seems to be a good bonding thing and a great fun thing to do. Man, nobody can touch Pete. He's just, like, you know. So I'm glad he's in a band and playing because I think if he was out twocking in cars, he'd have killed himself, you know, years ago. <laughs> And he's been in the band now since 2010, so that's nine years. That's such a, that's such a nice story. Yeah, um, it, was just, it was something that sort of resonated with me because I, I kind of had the same thing when I was, you know, kind of like 10 years old. Almost obsessive about music. Yeah, when yeah. you're always thinking about it. Uh, that's, that was it, you know, schoolwork, nah, didn't matter, you know. I know, you know when I got to do my um, O-levels, as they were called then, or GCSEs, whatever they're called now, um, I never even bothered reading the books that I've been given. Just uh, one because it's like you have to read this, and I, I'm really not big on sort of being you want told to, choose what to do. You do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know. um, so being told to read a book that wasn't it, and then sort of sitting there, it, it only dawned on me, you know, what a twerp I was when, you know, the 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 the, the book was Ring of Bright Water. And they were just asking who the characters were in the book. I mean, what could be simpler than that? Unless you haven't read the book. Yeah, of course. And they're going, who was Stinky Poo? You know, and I just thought, I don't know. It was mongoose. Did I had somebody talk about a mongoose. There isn't a mongoose in it, you know. <laughs> but, so consequently, I failed. Failed everything. And, um, and my friends, I had a really, really good friend, Adam Ockelford, who, who is a wonderful man, fantastic musician. Uh, and he's professor of music at Roehampton University and he works very uh, very much with blind children um, and uh, Derek Paravarici is uh, actually he, he mentors him and I don't know if you know the story about Derek uh, but he, he was born with uh, ROP which is retina of uh, prematurity uh, retinopathy of prematurity something like um, and it's because he was born prematurely uh, and he was put in the oxygen uh, tent and um, the, the retina, they, at such an early age, the retinas really can't take that massive blast of oxygen. So um, 
you know, the, the blood vessels just go at the back and then the, the kids are blind from then on. Okay. He was also, he sort of suffered problems at him and um, he was severely autistic. But he has this incredible savant ability where, which started becoming apparent when he was four or five years old, that he could sit at a piano and he could hear a piece of music and play it. And, and, and he's gone on to, you know, he, he now tours and, and gives concerts wherever he goes. It, you know, in, in his personal life, he can, you know, he struggles to dress himself, he, he can't do any, any of the things that we sort of take for granted, that we think, you know, that would make him an idiot. But of course, it's not, he's just somewhere else on the spectrum. And his talent, his hearing is everything. It's and um, it, yeah. absolutely incredible talent, you know, just uh, unbelievable talent. Anyway, his mentor is uh, Professor Adam Watford. Uh, and, and I was at school with him. Me and Adam went through Cows High School together. And Adam was fantastic, you know, he was sort of grade eight piano by the time he was 13 or 14. And, you know, he, he'd do his music O level, no problem. And he did his music A level, absolutely no problem. And I was still struggling. I couldn't get my head around any of this. Because it didn't seem important to me in the slightest. I just had this, this absolute oh, conviction that, that it, it didn't matter. You know, there's no point in me doing this because I needed actually to be concentrating on all this stuff. Why not become the greatest drummer in the world? Which obviously never happened. Yeah. But it didn't matter because it was just this sort of blind drive that, that was going to get me, you know, off of the Isle of Wight, move to London and then make it in the music business, you know, which, you know, whatever else anybody says, ultimately I did do that. Yeah. You did? Going, you know, like some of the things that you got told to read at school, or like things that you got taught and kind of thought, oh, this is a bit long, I'm not really interested in this. Um, did you ever find yourself in hindsight kind of actually investigating it for yourself? Oh yeah, like, Abs absolutely. That's a, that's a very astute thing because I, my wife Rhea um, studied horticulture and uh, she, you know, she, she really, really went into it and she just had all of these uh, amazing books uh, of horticulture and, you know. Uh, and I was, I just had this thing, I've always loved trees. Um, and so I just start reading up about the trees and I, I, I sort of carry in my head the, the Latin names of our indigenous trees. Um, and my teachers would have been proud of me if I could go back to Cows High School now and say, look, you know, I actually can carry something in my head. And, and you're absolutely right, you know, that when, when I left school, science fiction, I, I just adored Isaac Asimov books and Frank Herbert books and um, Arthur C. Clarke's books, you know. I mean, 2001 is a masterpiece, you know, not just the, the book, but the, uh, the film. And then, you know, 2010, uh, it is just as good. I, it's just like fantastic, this vision that these people sort of have in their heads. I, I really love that. That creativity is, you know, is, is fantastic. So, yeah, you know, it was just that as a kid. Wasn't what you were into. It wasn't what I was into at all. It was just the music, you know. The music and being dictated to is not nice for you. It's, it, it's not good, is it? You know, and I, I suppose some, some kids take to it and some kids don't, you know. And I was just one of the don't camp. Well, know? a lot in the don't camp, they end up making it. And uh, what I wanted to, to ask you next was the, you know, how do you see, or like, how do you remember, or kind of like, what's the version that you've got of, of, of how things went from that, kind of like focus on drumming uh, to level 42 taking off and and you know was it a, was it a great struggle or was it something that the the you know you, you remember it being quite quite easy you know it was it, it was always you never know you never knew what was coming and I found the I found the uncertainty um, of, of actually having left home and moved to London and of course, you know, my other buddies in the band, uh, Phil Gould, who was the original drummer and lyricist, and Mike Lindup, the keyboard player. Obviously, Mike's still in the band today. 
and, and Phil's older brother Boongle, the guitarist and, uh, and lyricist. Um, you know, we, we were just, they did it right, really. Um, well, maybe not so much Boom, but like Phil and, and Mike w went to the Gilroy School of Music, Mike and Phil went to the Royal Academy of Music. So they, they kind of had this, you know, they had this system that they could fit into. For me, I, I just sort of came up and I was, I got a job in, in a music store, um, you know, in Chan Crossroad, Macari's Music. But just because at least I would sort of somehow be connected with music, but there was just that, this sort of inward fear of like, what if this doesn't happen, you know, am I really going to, and you know, the odd times that I go home and visit my parents, you know, dad would say, why don't you come home, Nipper, you know, what's that? it must be horrible up there, you know, just struggling. And I think it was because he said that, it, you know, in a way it made me think, no, I've got to, uh, I just have to keep going, you know, I need to make something happen with the music. And the, you know, as, as sort of chance would have it, the, when I was working in Macari's, I, I got a chance to go and join a band in Austria as drummer, because that's what I wanted to do. So, I, you know, I, I, as I always do, I just sort of throw everything into it. And I took my albums and my clothes and uh, my drum kit, jumped in the back of this van and off we went to, to Austria. Three months later, nothing's happened at all. It was one gig, we were, everybody was starving. And I just thought, I've got to get out of here. And the, the other guys in the band said, yeah, well, look, you know, we'll, we'll chip together, we'll get your ticket home. Um, and we'll send the drums on and your clothes and your record, you know, your vinyl collection later. And of course that never happened. <laughs> but I did go back, I went back again went, uh, about four months later to get them. And uh, at the, I went to the music store and, and uh, Half my drums were in the window and half had been sold already, so that was gone. The albums, my precious vinyl collection was just gone, uh, you know. But um, that's all right. These are the things that, that kind of harden you up and make you realise that it's a tough world. And, yeah. You know, you've just got to get on with it. Um, you know, so I came home and it did focus me on, um, well, one thing, the bass guitar, because it's like now I didn't have any drums. And, you know, uh, Boone and Phil and myself and Mike used to get together and jam on a Monday evening. And Phil had the drum kit, so that's kind of, you know, it's his drum kit. So, although, like, Boone and I be swapping between bass and guitar and whatnot, and, uh, you know, Phil was on the drums and Mike was on the piano, even though Mike was studying percussion at the Guildhall. So, um, yeah, that was it. But... Working in Macari's, I had the chance, because they didn't send any drums, there were no drums in there. Uh, they sold accordions and guitars and whatnot. So I'd sort of watch, every so often you get like one of the sort of touring bands that come in and uh, they, it's some cool dude to walk in and say, let me have a look at that Fender there. So sort of <laughs> pass the Fender. And you sort of go, pong, 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 pong. And you say, yeah man, you should check out Larry Graham. And I was just sitting, sort of soaking this all in, thinking, well, I can do that. You know, this is something that, once again, it was a bit like the drumming thing. That it doesn't actually hold any, it, it, there's no mystery to me about this. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's great. You know, it's like, well, see you, man. Yeah, thanks very much for the chat. The time in the back room. Bang, bang, bang. Said, yeah, bang, bang, bang. And then I just started, you know, drumming on the bass guitar, really. I was, so I was doing what I wanted to do now on a different instrument and this is where the, the luck came in it's because this happened to be 1979 just 1980 was coming in punk was on its way out and people were looking for this something else and there was this this thing called brick funk starting so the dj the funk mafia the djs um, were running these all-nighters and soul weekenders and, and what have you and um, a guy called Andy Soika, who had his own independent record label, at, um, uh, Elite Records, and had a, he just had a hit with his, his band called uh, Dancing in That Space, his band was Atmosphere. Uh, he was sort of just looking out and around and he knew John Gould, who was working at MCA, and that was Phil and Boone's older brother. He was doing uh, marketing or promotion at MCA. 
And uh, he said, oh, you should go and see my brother's band. You know, that they, they, they sort of, it sounds quite funky to me, you know. And he came along and heard it, and he's, he, he was sort of quite unimpressed, but said, there's one thing you do, he said, and it's where you're playing bass to me. And uh, if you can get, get a singer to come in and sing it and come up with a melody line, I'll record it. And we did, and that, that became Love Meeting Love, the first single, which wasn't all sort of flying thumbs and bits and pieces, but it was great because suddenly, you know, I, you wouldn't believe how exciting it was hearing your record being played on the radio, yeah. on power play, on like Radio Caroline, you know, and some of these uh, sort of more, you know, off the scale radio stations. And, and, and that was just incredible. And then, pow, that was it. We sort of thought, this is, this is where we're going from here. And then, like, before you knew it, came up with love games and the riff of love games and and the, the time was just right and people were going oh this is amazing you know is this a band from America that, that are doing this stuff you know and um, obviously we weren't you know a <laughs> band from the Isle of Wight <laughs> but it does you know you would assume oh yeah of, of course you know because our, our heroes all, all, all our Isle influences you know were were all bands that, that were sort of American based, really. Uh, you know, your Earth, Wind and Fires and your Herbie Hancocks and Stevie Wonders and um, Return to Forever and Mahavishnu Orchestra and all these amazing musicians. So that's it's really all in cool. there in that. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's all in there. Well, know? we've interviewed Verdine from Earth, Wind and Fires. Oh, he's a lovely he's a guy, isn't he? Yeah, he was a real sweetheart, it, I thought. Yeah, he, he's fantastic. We had the great pleasure and honour of having them produce an album for us in 1983. So we got to spend three months recording in the, the complex, which was their studio in Los Angeles. What an and incredible experience. It was amazing. amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, so with, with everybody from, or was it like... No, it was Ver, Verdine White yeah. and Larry Dunn, who were the oh, keyboard yeah. player yeah. and the bass player, yeah. you know. But Maurice, every once in a while, had dropped by and... Uh, you know, B. Lloyd Taylor co-wrote the song with us. Um, so it was, Incredible. and it was their studio. And it was amazing because it's like, the, the complex was very good. Uh, George Massenberg had, had a, like his own laboratory there, so he invented the flying failures. So all of this sort of tech was really high tech and, and sort of cutting edge exactly. stuff. And, you know, um, George Duke and... Uh, Louis Johnson were working the next door and they just sort of stuck their head in the stuff and you know, my God man, it's Louis Johnson, it's, it's George Duke, you know, clunk. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it was just, an it, was, it was an incredible experience, you know, and, and it gave us our first top 10 single here in the UK. So, you know, something was working right. But I always felt when we were there, because, you know, we wanted to go and learn how they were doing this stuff, you know. What was the secret of like, Earth, Wind and Fire and how did they get that sort of so tight and so smooth? But, but I think the reason they were quite intrigued with us and wanted to produce us because they heard us as they, when they were touring Europe in 82. And they wanted to know what it was that we were doing. Yeah, they were. That, that people were listening to and why it was being successful. It all be on an underground level, but it was like people were talking. Heard this band, so they were, you know, that we so still get in the studio and they're going like, So, what you got then? You know, we're going, Well, you know, what you tell you us, yeah, <laughs> what, tell yeah. us what to do, you know. And yes, yeah. anyway, we ended up with that. And the sun goes down, um, living it up was the, the sort of the top 10 single, but it was very enjoyable. And the record company, obviously, they just invested in sort of three months with us. Now they were trying to take it seriously, so then they got some stylists involved, and then we started shooting videos, promo videos, because they were sort of, it, if you didn't have a video, you, you weren't anybody. It was all part of the thing, you know. And, um, you know, when I look back now, uh, you know, at photographs from that period in time, you know, I think, yeah, it's all right. And I still, I just still see the sort of the kid in me that was just winging it, you know, the whole time. It was just... Uh, That's the best bit. To it is the best, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, it is. Because what makes this whole industry just so amazing and fascinating I, well I think it is yeah because it's uh, you know it's you know it's like that the old national lottery thing where the hand comes out the clouds and goes it's you 
yeah, and yeah. ting, you know, and you get you get the crack at it because I, you know, you wouldn't believe how many amazing musicians I know that can't get arrested, you know. But it's it's that kind of even when you're talking about daydreaming at school, it's that that already is a sign that you're probably going to be because <laughs> you, well, you care I'm more mad. you yeah. care you care more about that and you care about other things other people sort of think well maybe I'll get around to the music in the evening yeah well yeah that's true you know that, that, that you is know, you true didn't, you didn't, didn't even occur to you there was no mystery to the fact that music is kind of more important than this stuff no it was, it was just important. there that was absolutely fundamental uh, you know how I found it. it comes back to you know what I said in the first place I was just convinced that, that I didn't have to worry about anything else because it was that was going to happen. It was going to be all right just because it was all just sort of popping around in my head, you know. And and they were in a lot of ways that they're you're spoiled for choice now, the kids. You know, it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. But YouTube's there, so everybody can check out everybody else. You know, and I see the the, the sort of the skill levels of you know the the current crop of players and the ones that are coming through, and they you know. So it's free education. Yeah, it is, and it's incredible because that's their that's their university. You know, that's their that's yeah. the schooling that they're getting is actually visual and audio. You know, whereas with me, if if I saw like the Mahavishnu Orchestra, quite by chance on um, in concert on on BBC Two back in 1972, it took ten days for the vinyl to arrive. You know, and even then, I'd go to the record store. And I went, there was a band on. Um, in concert the other night, you know, I said they were just incredible musicians, and I said that one guy was just dressed in white, and he had like very sort of smart haircut. And the guy is sort of, and I said that the, the drummer had this glass drum kit. I said it was made of glass, and that was Billy Cobham, of course. And uh, you know, and the guy's going, yeah. And I think about that. Oh, I said, oh, was that the Mahavishnu Orchestra? Yeah. I'm like, I'll order the vinyl for it. And then you had to wait 10 days. You, know, so you kind of treasure it more as a result. It's yeah. almost an embarrassment of riches yeah. now for everyone. You get, you get in that vinyl like, up your school blazer and cycling home after you've gone really and picked it up. It's just incredible. And then putting it on the stereogram. You know, and that... Bam! Down! I was like, oh my God. And I was lucky because I had another really good friend of mine, um, Simon Footer, who went on to join the, the Air Force and had a, a fantastic career in the Air Force. Um, he, 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 was, he looked a bit like Brian Ferry, you know, and I'd seen, also seen Roxy music on in concert. And it was just that whole sort of the image thing. It was the first time I think I've been conscious of the image thing. You know, it was about the same time that the Bowie thing was, you know, there, this glam rock. Yeah, it's just like so, you know. And when you're 14, 15 years of age, it's it's a very attractive thing because you just think, how can they be like that? You know, you look at yourself in the mirror, yeah. and you've got a pudding ball cut, <laughs> and you've got a blazer that your mum thought you'd grow into. So you're sort of constantly walking along with sleeves down here and stuff, you know, brief cuts, uh, with nothing in it because I wasn't bothering to do anything anyway. Um, you know, I looked like a hovercraft. I just because you couldn't see my feet because of the briefcase, and when you couldn't see my hands, just sort of drifting up and down the school corridors. <laughs> but there was Roxy music, and there was Bowie, and um, you know when we got the the Roxy music album, the first one, uh, and Simon and I used to go home and just, you know, particularly on Thursdays when Mum was at the supermarket, it's like definitely there. I bet all the neighbours just a dreaded Thursday afternoons, actually. Well, you never know. Maybe that. I bet they're all. I bet they're all talking about it now, saying what they heard and. Uh, maybe. Oh, we thought that. he'd do all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I thought that. he'd make it. Yeah, he was a cheeky one. That sort of thing. But, one, um, one of our neighbours, uh, the lady, sort of uh, had this great habit of mishearing lyrics. And there was, a, there was a Max Romeo song, my sister had the 45, um, and it was lie down girl, let me push it up, push it up, lie down. And she was hearing it as let me push it up, push it up, which I sort of thought was funny. <laughs> like what are the kind of deep cuts or the, 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 the album tracks and, and tracks that, yeah, the, the, the casual oh, listeners yeah. don't like, but say they're watching this interview and they, they don't just want hits. 
know, well, it, it would be something to listen to, yeah. Yeah, um, Eyes Water Falling, I think, is, is there's a track called Eyes Water Falling. I think that was an album to The Pursuit of Accidents. I could be wrong, I, I always get these things wrong. A June Tune on the Level 42 album. Uh, the early takes is interesting because, you know, when I listen to it, it's almost like a diary of where we wanted to go, where we thought we'd be going. Uh, which was different from where we ended up. <clears throat> but, the, you, you know, one thing I am proud of with Level 42 is the the fact that we did develop as songwriters and we developed really quite well, you know, because we, we all started out really not knowing about how to structure any of this stuff and do it. We just were four mates who jammed. And then we had Wally Badger who came in, really from record one, you know, as long the fifth member, and Wally was a great sort of soundsmith. So, you know, you can really enjoy some really good sort of synth uh, erotica on and sounds. You know that that Wally and Mike used to sort of pull together and do. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, there's there's lots of things, but it, I, I'm I'm happy to th say that you know that the there weren't any of our albums that were just sort of out and out attempts at, at poppery because you can listen to any of the albums and if you don't listen to the ones that you you were here on Radio 2 or whatever you will find some stuff in there that, that's quite sort of yeah that's quite challenging and quite go ahead for its time well it was a real pleasure to meet you and so thanks yeah so thanks Thomas you. well it's lovely Hi. chatting to you well you just did a lot of listening didn't you sorry about that no, no, that's, those are the best types. Start rambling when you're 60.